Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MatchFit Football Podcast. I'm Darren Potts, and remember to check out on all the forms of social media at MatchFit Football, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, for all your MatchFit footballing needs. But today's guest, it is the Plymouth Argyle goalkeeper. It is Callum Burton. Callum, welcome to the show. Delighted to get you on. Perfect. No, thanks for that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to obviously speaking with yourself and diving into it. Yeah, it's going to be good fun. We're going to talk a little bit about your about your performance, about how you stay in shape, your trading methods, and of course, um, the mindset. But tell me a little bit about moving to Plymouth because it's a it's a new club for you this season. Have you have you found it so far? Yeah, um, I've loved it. To be fair, from sort of the first first day coming down here, um, I don't think I definitely didn't realise how big a club it was. Um, until I moved down here, obviously you have people to say how big it was. It used to obviously be in the championship and then had a few tough years. Um, but until you get down here and you see sort of, obviously I've played at the stadium before, so you, you see sort of that aspect of it playing against them. But until you get down and you see obviously the setup that they've tried to put in place now, obviously the stadium, the training sort of ground and the base that they've got, it's such a big club that they, they want to get back up to sort of the championship level which they were at a few years ago and obviously that was a massive um, massive draw for me because obviously I want to get as high in the game as I can um, and after getting promoted last year obviously the next logical progression was League One so now I was sort of as soon as I heard that there was interest in joining I, I come down here straight away to have a look around the place and then yeah it was it was a no-brainer really for me. What about the expectation level? Because you you mentioned how big the club was and where it wants to be, and you know the size and stature of the club, and you know what it was like playing against Plymouth, but now playing for Plymouth, have you noticed anything different in terms of expectation, the fans? Is there different types of pressure at Plymouth? Um, I wouldn't. It, it doesn't. It's not a club. Obviously, there's the expectation that you've you've got to perform well and. Obviously, it's sort of a club, even though they were in League Two only two years ago, that they want to be at the right end of the table. But I think it's it's a very sort of family orientated, and because obviously it's quite an isolated place, Plymouth, it's the fans just get behind you. Really, I mean, yeah. it's obviously I've not been here during the the sort of bits where they got relegated and stuff. But from since I've joined, I'm mm-hmm. um, obviously we're sitting at the top of the table now. But at the start of the season and sort of through that you saw that there was just pure support for the the team so obviously you've got that expectation because you want to be up there you want to be challenging for um promotion places but i think it's such a good club for supporting the team which obviously goes under the radar because it, it helps the lads so much when we're playing and that having the support behind even if we go behind in games like we have done this season the the home support is I'd probably say got us a few points just because it's kept us going right till the end. So yeah, it's that's that sort of thing's massively underestimated and helps the team. Absolutely. And that home support, like you said, it is, it's massive and it helps the team. And Plymouth being, as you mentioned, you know, almost an isolated place, so to speak. Um, but you move from Cambridge, you know, to to Plymouth and Cambridge being nice and remotely somewhat close to London and everything that goes alongside that. Was there any difference for you moving to Plymouth and was there any adjusting that you had to do or did you know what, what was you were kind of going down here and it was football focus? Yeah, I mean, sort of I've, I've always had the mindset that I don't I've never really minded where I've moved to because it's. At the end of the day, it's still in England, really. So yeah. it's it's not that bad. Yeah. And yeah, the decision was massively football orientated because of how big the club was. It saw it was such a big step up from no disrespect to Cambridge, but obviously the size of Argyle compared to Cambridge, it's a big step up in everything. Um so for me, yeah, it was no brainer in that respect, but the, the one thing I didn't realize was how far everything was away until <laughs> one game, and then you travel in sort of seven, eight hours to get up to Yorkshire. So, no, it's it was obviously the location, but it's such a lovely place to live as well. You're so close to Cornwall, and it's it's such a family club, like I said, it's it's amazing, and they really make you feel welcome down here. 
It's great to hear that. And one of the one of the other things when I was doing a bit of research into you and into your move with with Plymouth Argyle and stuff, one of the things that I came across was you had a bit of a relationship where you got to speak to Darren, the goalkeeping coach, whenever you were coming, you know, to move to Plymouth. How big an impact was that conversation with with the goalkeeping coach and with with the the gaffer and the boys in charge? What was that? How big a factor was that in your decision to to move to Plymouth? It was it was massive. I mean, Darren called me the day after um, I found out that Cambridge weren't going to offer me a contract. So, from my perspective, seeing how eager they were to bring me down here was a massive, massive pull for me because that's ultimately what you want. You want to have staff that believe in you um, and want to push you on because, and especially the goalie coach because he's the sort of person that sees the most of you, and you probably spend the most time with him out of the staff. So been able to speak to him and see what he was like and how he likes to work. And obviously, yeah, we had quite a few conversations over the summer before I'd signed and then obviously more after. Um, yeah, it was it was huge for me. And again, he was sort of saying, like, I don't think you fully realise how big the club was. He said, I didn't until I moved down here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was it was bang on in that sort of respect. So yeah, it was, and then obviously the gaffer spoke to me, um, kind of when everything was agreed. And yeah, it's just the way they sold it to me is exactly how it is as well. So I've come in and everything that they're trying to put together and trying to build for going to that next level and pushing on into the championships definitely in place. And you can kind of see that from the start of the season that we've had. Well, it's absolutely fascinating to hear that because I always find, you know, when you're talking to different people, it is the relationship as well between the coaching staff and the players, which ultimately bring out the best results. Um, what qualities do you would you look for as a player and a coach to help push you on and help you to improve and reach your goals? Um, I think the biggest thing that I've sort of looked for is honesty, really, because you can... I've been with people in the past that you spend a lot of time with and they're not, they don't tell you exactly what they think. I don't know whether it's because they don't feel completely comfortable or they might think that it will affect you and Mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But then at the end of the day, it's kind of holding back information for you to get better because I found that it's, especially early on in my career, they haven't told me stuff. And then, it comes later down the line and you're not getting a contract because you don't do that stuff. Mm. And you look back and you're like, well, only if you told me a year ago, yeah, then we wouldn't be in this situation because I've had that long to improve it. So yeah, it's, it's a massive thing for me is honestly, I'd rather, I'd rather my goalie coach, my manager, whoever's in charge, tell me straight, even if it's brutal, because it means then you've got a base to build on. Because if you just go along, if you were to go through the motions for, the 10, 15 years of your career, if you're lucky to have that long, Mm -hmm. you're not going to get to the level that you would have if you'd have been told your faults and what you can improve on. So, Mm -hmm. yes, that's massive. And to be fair, since I've joined the club, that's what I think has been so good about the coaching staff we've got. Obviously, we've got the gaffer, we've got Stephen Schumacher, Kevin um, Nance as well, who's obviously been here the longest. Um, And then Daz, everybody tells you how it is and the players know where they stand um obviously the staff know where they stand with each other and it's it's so much better than people not knowing because and it means that you can have them honest conversations with each other without that worry of oh what's he going to think what i hope he doesn't think that i'm being like horrible to him because they're the when you're not playing well and when you need a bit of a kick up the arse they're the conversations you need to have so from day one if you've got that relationship with everybody to be able to do that it makes it so much better and so much easier and just the atmosphere of the team is sort of a no fear no fear ethos and it's it's been such refreshing to come into that and obviously it just it helped everybody get the best out of each other really well that atmosphere you know you're feeling a bit refreshed coming in there you're getting that honesty you're obviously getting the training that you need the training that you want you're being pushed every day to to, you know to improve to work harder and to grow but i want to go back in time a little bit i want to focus just slightly on your journey to becoming a professional footballer um obviously i'm assuming you loved the game from you were a child and you were always a fan of the game but what was it that drew you in 
the wanting to become a professional footballer or what made that decision for you or was that a decision that you made at a young younger age when you felt okay I, I can do this um yeah it was I, I, to be fair I probably got into football a bit later than most lads could have. My, my mom and dad pushed me into it because they said like you need to sort of get in some I wasn't the most confident kid and I think they thought that if I was to go into just like at the local team's training and just see how basically it was kind of like a trial to see if I liked football to start with when I was like nine and ten yeah. so I went that sort of moment onwards I, I loved it mm. um, and sort of I spent a year two years at local level mm. playing for Nova United back in Shropshire and it it was a, it was just a pure love that made me improve back then and then I was lucky enough to get into Shrewsbury, the academy that they had, the academy set up early on about under 11s. Um, and then, yeah, from then on, you never really have when you obviously you'd love to be a professional footballer, but you don't really have the understanding of how it works and how you get into it. You just kind of just play year by year in the academy and slowly build your way up. And then it wasn't really until I was probably under 14s that it started like, oh, you can you can get a scholarship would make you full time in a few years and there was a few sort of players that were around me that were getting in the youth team playing with the scholars and it's kind of like oh okay mm -hmm. like if you're good enough you get that sort of opportunity so mm -hmm. it was yeah it was until then I got mine when I was in the under 15s and it's sort of the minute that that full-time football is put in front of you you just yeah I'm now let's let's do it let's give it a go mm -hmm. um so yeah that's kind of how it happened for me it was for sort of in the latter years of the academy it's just like sort of a light box moment where you're like oh let's this I can actually get to this level I've made it for all the academy age groups so mm -hmm. sort of why can't I get into the full-time aspect of it and it yeah sort of went from there so whenever you were beginning to have that realization of oh I can do this I can make it into full-time football was there anything you'd done different in terms of your dedication your discipline or your work rate and um, was there more of a focus on making it professional switching maybe slightly away from I'm just doing this because I love it yeah I think that definitely came about I remember it was like year nine at school so under 14s because sort of going to secondary school I was at school that pushed sports a lot but they didn't push football yeah so rugby athletics cricket orientated so because obviously I was that sort of a gifted sports person at the school they pushed you into all them avenues so go and play rugby sevens go play in the cricket team go this and up until sort of that period I loved doing it and I went and I played and then sort of I got to that 14s in the 14s phase and I was like you know what I'm not I'm not going to be good that good at rugby I'm not going to be that good at cricket let's just put all your effort into football so like at school I started just saying I'm, I'm not playing rugby today because I used to get little injuries mm -hmm. uh, I remember I broke my ribs the one day playing rugby and I was put me out for sort of a month two months of football and I was mm -hmm. like I'm going to actually try and get into the professional aspect of it I can't be having these little injuries and stuff so yeah I think longest groin strain in the world keeping me out of rugby at school uh, and that's yeah it's sort of you just from that moment the two years that led under 15s and 16s I just threw myself fully into it with sort of no distractions um obviously you stayed up with your sort of school studies and stuff but any extracurricular kind of went out the window and it just was go to we basically trained sat four times a night four times a week and then played on Sundays so it was just that and just trying to improve trying to play up age groups and just trying to get to that next level as fast as I could mm -hmm. and an interesting point as well because you were coming up through the academy and you ended up at Shrewsbury and everything that comes with with being at Shrewsbury and being with the club there a famous English goalkeeper Joe Hart now at Celtic Premier League winner England international great career whatever you want to say about Joe Hart, you know, he's had a phenomenal career. He's came up through Shrewsbury Town. Was was that something or someone you could look up to and aspire and say, look, if he can do it, I can do it. And was there any form of maybe mentorship, maybe not with Joe, but potentially with a goalkeeping coach or some of the older lads there at Shrewsbury that helped you in your journey? Yeah, it was obviously, it was always the one sort of 
pull that people always said, like, oh, I'm not sure he'd be a good for goalie. So look at Joe Hart and obviously that. And we were actually, to be fair, that sort of, them sort of four or five years that I was in the middle of at the academy, we had a lot of good goalies. We sold um, one to Everton, Mason Springthorpe. Um, we had Harry Lewis, who was two years below me. He got sold to Southampton. He's still there. So it was sort of a really good, really good time for goalies and a lot of them got pros and went into sort of be third second choice in the first team so it was it was when you look back at it it was so good that you were able because obviously you trained in them sort of age groups it was sort yeah. of three four age groups of goalies were trained together so when you look back at it it was probably the fact that all of us were doing so well because the others around us were so good as well mm. So it was just a healthy atmosphere that got made at the club um, to bring goalies through. So we had sort of Glyn Thompson, who's now at Leicester, um, Dave Bennett. I remember him being big for me when I Dave T came in and sort of completely changed the ethos of the academy goalkeeping department. And it, it reaped the rewards, to be fair. And <laughs> even see now you've got Cam Gregory's come up for the youth team into the first team. And that's, that's what they wanted to do. And it was so good to be part of it um, and obviously we've got the amount of goalie coaches that have gone from there bigger clubs got Gav Ward now at QPR um, and it's Dan Connor who's now gone to Forest Green you were so lucky looking back at the coaches you had without realising that they'll go on and be good first team goalie coaches at good levels and coach good goalies so you sort of look back at it and you're thankful that you had them influences so early on in your career Absolutely. And because it worked out for the goalkeepers, you know, you guys were getting such a high level of quality training and it worked out for the coaching staff. They were able to apply their trade and learn and develop as coaches as well. And like you said, you've been able to move on. Other keepers have been able to move on and the coaching staff have been able to move on. So it's almost been, you know, a real marriage that's just kind of worked for everyone involved at that particular time. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously if that's what, you've got to look at, that's what kind of you want in your academy setup. If you're an academy manager, you want sort of ambitious players and you want ambitious staff that they don't want, no disrespect to Shrewsbury, but they don't want to stay at Shrewsbury. They want to go to the champ, they want to go to the Premier League. And yeah. That's, I think, is, especially that, obviously I don't know what it's like now because I haven't been there for so long, but at that time, it was definitely sort of that atmosphere. Yeah, I remember going into training that sort of I was only young I was only 14 15 and kind of beating myself up if I wasn't good very good because you had sort of these lads who were like so Harry I remember like he was two years younger than me so I'm actually better than me and I'm thinking well, okay we're better than this like you wanted to get into the youth team and one of the under 12s goalies had been better than you mm -hmm. and that's sort of what you had to push yourself on and it I remember in them two years under 15s under 16s it pushed me so much on the, I was playing youth sort of with 18 year olds when I was 15 and then I even got the chance to train sort of first team regularly when I was 14, 15 which just again was so good for your development and it, it obviously helped me transition kind of a bit earlier into first team football in the first team dressing room. Well, that's that, that's obviously been vital for you and it's helped you so much in your career but what's what was the biggest difference from youth football or even under 18s football the, the men's first team football. What was what was the differences that you noticed when you made that step up? The stand the standard of training was just was through the roof. You sort of you, you used to as youth team as you used to watch the first team and mm -hmm. until you're actually involved in the training, you don't realise how good the first team players were. You sort of you watch them on match days, you watch them, you're like, oh yeah, I can pass the ball like that, I can save mm -hmm. that. But until you're in working alongside and you can't really judge yourself. Yeah. So I remember coming in and like doing shooting practice and at the start, 80, 90% would fly in. Mm -hmm. And you kind of you come away thinking, oh I've got to sort of up my game if I want to train with these. Because ultimately, especially when you were younger as well, you're like, if I'm no good, they're not gonna, they're not gonna want me to train with them. Yeah. So it was always that, that aspect of sort of improving yourself just to be good in training. Mm -hmm wanted to be invited back as a, cause I remember I got the chance to have a day release at school every Thursday and come in and train with the first team. Gav Ward was a goalie coach at the time. And it, it massively helped me just because I was training with 
players who are now playing in the champ who have gone on to have good careers. I was training with them when I was 14, 15. So then when you go back to your age group, especially, I was I was saving everything. I was like, oh, this is this is e- not easy, but this is so much easier than going against the pros. So it just meant that you were getting ready for that sort of step up earlier. And it meant when you went back to your age group to play the games and stuff like that, it felt it felt slower, if anything. So you could read games better and do things a lot quicker than you would do before because you're used to what better players, older players would do instead of the youth team sort of players that you were playing against. And one of the things you probably noticed, and it's something I, I want to ask you about is, when you played at youth team level, you probably seen a lot of natural ability with certain players. But when you came to maybe first team level, was there a lot of coaching and a lot of technical work that maybe was a bit different from the youth team level or was it very similar? I think it was the biggest thing is that I saw was that when you were young, a, a lot younger, you tried to get coached into sort of the same thing so if there was something that you did that was a bit off or you didn't do that was sort of technically what they wanted they'd try coach you out of it Mm -hmm. so it used to be a i used to find training a lot of trying to change what you were to get better obviously so you used to do but then the biggest thing that i found when you went with the first teamers is that they've all got little things that they haven't got out of but that makes them sort of the player they were and so like if you were to put if you were to go and put any goalkeepers up against each other and do different things for them each of them would have completely different ways of doing the same thing but because they've done it so many like think about how many times a goalie will catch a ball mm. thousands of times like a week probably mm. they've just perfected their individual way of doing it and it's mm. it's as a kid, you think, oh, I've got to be perfect. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. But then as long as you're good at doing what you what you do, sort of that triggered in my mind that as long as I get 999 times right out of 1,000, it'll serve me well. Mm-hmm. And like, I have different ways of doing things to what's probably seen as the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the biggest sort of thing that I found was that as long as you work on what you want to, the goal you want to be, Mm-hmm. and the goalie that you think you can be you've just got to work your hardest and it'll as long as you practice enough that'll be the way the one you become sort of thing mm-hmm. well it's that practice it's that repetition and you mentioned earlier from the coaching staff you know the honesty of what you need to improve on it's obviously all went hand in hand with you in your journey to become you know obviously the keeper that you are now and the keeper that you're still progressing to want to become as you go on further through your career um but want to ask you a question now and We've talked about, like I said, the honesty. We've talked about hard work. We've talked about being dedication and even the repetition of catching balls and things like that. But in your opinion, what are the key components or the key attributes needed to succeed as an elite professional? Uh, I'd, the biggest thing has got to be obviously your mind because I'd say, especially once you become a professional, you, you're obviously good enough to or you wouldn't have got a contract. So it's all to do with how you deal with situations and how you get your mind to to make your body as good as you can be. Mm-hmm. I've found that when things haven't gone my way, whenever, if my mind switches off, I become terrible. Mm-hmm. And that's ultimately, if your mind's at 100% focus, dedication, obviously you can't be at 100% all the time. You need to shut off and do stuff. But if you're mentally there that'll be what the top top goalies are like that'll be what the top any professional sportsman Mm -hmm. so you've got to sort of train i found that you've got to train your mind harder than you've got to train your body because that's ultimately what's in a game you have little setbacks seasons you have little setbacks but as long as they don't become big setbacks and big issues that's what what happens so not dwelling too much on mistakes not dwelling too much on losses and things like that and I think if you've got that sort of elite mentality your physical side because obviously that'll just make you train better improve physically improve technically everything like that Mm -hmm. the minute your mind's on it 100% and you're fully 
investing and doing the right things and not dwelling on the wrong things and stuff, you'll, you'll just go through the roof. And that's what the sort of the top players that I've been lucky enough to work with, they've they've got that in abundance. But that that mindset, obviously loads of people are gifted, but nobody's Superman. But if you're built differently mentally, you've a chance of accomplishing anything. And you've talked about the importance of the mindset there. And you've talked about training your mind. How do you train your mind? What is it that you do? Do you meditate? Do you do yoga? Um, or do you surround yourself with the right people? What is it that the Callum Burton does differently to maintain this strong mindset? I think a lot of it is um, trial and error, to be honest. I've, I've tried all sorts um, in thinking. Also, making mistakes is how I've managed to do it because the amount of mistakes, setbacks, everything like that, you learn ways of dealing with it. Like early on in my career, with big setbacks, I'd, I'd just shut off for a week, two weeks, whatever. And I just sort of sulk and it was no, that didn't achieve anything. It just made me worse. So it's getting that sort of any setback. It's not, it doesn't have to mean that you go and affect your mistakes in games. It's happened. Try and, try and make sure that the next sort of thing you do is as good as before. Mm-hmm. And if by doing that in training, I found a lot it will translate over to games because ultimately that's what training's for. So sort of making mistakes in games, you want to obviously minimise and you don't want to do as much as um, you basically want to be perfect in games, but obviously you, you know you always can't be. Mm-hmm. So by making mistakes in training, making mistakes away from that, it means that you can get a more, a more perfect sort of game because you can, even if you do make a mistake, the rest of the things you do in that 90 minutes could be bang on. You just gotta make sure that nothing snowballs, nothing affects you too much. And yeah, it's just it's just trial and error because that's why obviously the big big things experience because everybody looks to experience pros, experience things and their ways of doing it. But it's just obviously from being put in them situations and having to deal with them things in the past because when they were 18, they wouldn't have been the same that they are now. So it's yeah, it's learning off them people I've learned is one of the biggest things as well because goalies especially I've worked with Alan McGregor and David Marshall who are in their 30s and played internationally and all them and the stuff you learn sort of from them is invaluable to take forward and you just you kind of wish you learned it earlier because it just means that you'd even be better by this stage but yeah it's trying to integrate I just try and take something little from every goalie that I work with and try and bring that into my game to try and make me better well always trying to improve you know that's that's sort of what i'm taking from that you're taking little things from every keeper to improve but also something you said that I want to touch on you said about making mistakes and making them a training and then you realize and then you're able to adapt and you're able to learn from it um do you ever have a fear of failure you know do those mistakes ever give you that fear of failure and how do you control that or how do you overcome those failure moments or those doubts and how do you maintain your confidence level? I think if you didn't have fear of failure, you you, you probably wouldn't be human in games because mm-hmm. you've got you've always got that. And it's it's learning that I've sort of started my career when I was 18, I was I was petrified of failure. Like mm-hmm. going into games thinking, I've got to be perfect here just to be able to get on and move to the next level and stuff. And in a way, I wish that I wasn't like that because you you don't then try new things you just literally you're like a robot you just want to stick to what you do and just not make a mistake so it's kind of like it's having it's learning that ultimately I've, I look at a game now and although there's three points on the line get hyped up as a kid like if you want to go and play in the first team you've, you've got to be at this level you've got to do this three points on the line every week like it's mm-hmm. massive the club's future all that and so so now I just go into games as it's it's a game of football, sort of it's what can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately that's what you've got to look at it as. I'm, I'm never nervous on the pitch. Obviously, you get your sort of pre-game a little bit of anxious to get out there and stuff. But the minute I'm on the pitch, it's it's sort of just all gone. Because I found that especially when I was younger, 
playing with fear just made me make mistakes all the time. I remember I went on alone as a young kid and I, my first game, petrified, made a mistake. Mm. Second game, I was like, ah, oh, I've made a mistake. I need to be on it this game. I can't make a mistake. And I make two mistakes with goals. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just snowballed. And it took me about six games just to get back to a level where I was like, right, just, just be yourself. But by then, I'd, I'd cost the team about, about six points. Mm -hmm. And it's it's learning that your your training's there for a reason. You're, you've got to try and play the game unconsciously and not consciously because the minute you think too much about it, you'll be slower, you'll be that. And training's there to make you as good as you can be. So just play the game unconsciously, what feels right and what your instincts are telling you to do, really. And that's what I try and do now. The, that that instinctual way of playing it's obviously served you really well in the last number of years you know you've got the move to where you are now and in, in, in Plymouth Argyle and you mentioned sometimes you can be a little bit anxious because you just kind of want to get the game started and all that sort of things but do you have any rituals or superstitions or routines that you would do prior to a game when you're sitting in the changing room or warming up um not not massively I, I've I like to keep sort of my pre-game routine as free as possible really because I, I used to as a kid again you hear about trying to learn off people you see other people with pretty much routines and stuff like that and it kind of I tried to do it and then again it was like that trial and error sort of thing yeah. is the minute I couldn't do them routines for whatever reason we were late to a game or we were this we were that mentally you're all over the place you're like oh, I haven't done haven't done that and oh, and you go into the games thinking about a million other things then right let's just play football kind of thing yeah so try and keep it as as relaxed as possible really because whether because it does happen I've turned up to games and they've had to delay kickoffs and yeah. all sorts and you've got to deal with what what's ultimately just in front of you and and I know from obviously past experience that if, if I have them and it doesn't happen and that it can't always happen because of things like that you just mentally you go so again it's just trying to get in that mental good space of it's just a game of football mm -hmm. you've done your prep in the week just go and do what you've been training to do and it'll it'll serve you well absolutely you know i think that comfortableness in terms of knowing what you're doing and coming from training and the repetition and knowing your role and almost even playing as you said unconsciously it all breeds that confidence level and that belief and self-belief in yourself to to have that faith in your own performance to go out and just play the game uh, but to touch on something that goes alongside that i want to touch about motivation what motivates you every week to keep wanting to improve and to get better Um, I think it's, for me, it was seeing the results. So sort of earlier on, I didn't get the chance to play as much as I wanted to. So it was a lot harder to see sort of results and what you were doing on the training pitch because you can translate it into games where everybody else sees you. So that was the biggest thing. I was like, it doesn't really matter what I do on the training ground because I'm not playing. So no one's trying to do anyway. So the motivation then was try to improve but I don't think it was as strong as when I started playing because then it was you're playing the Saturday try and get as ready as you can and be as good as you can because you want to be as good as you can on Saturday mm. when I started playing and seeing little things that I'd change in training benefit me so like sort of making a save that I don't think I'd have saved doing what I'd done previously mm. for me I was like that's brilliant like I've, mm. I've, I've done my job and probably help the team get points if it had been important times of the games because of that. So it just motivates you to see what I love watching other goalies, whether it's top level, yeah. whatever. Because that again, they all have such different styles and different ways of doing things that if you can take little bits and put it into your game to benefit your game, then the only person that's going to benefit long term. So yeah, it's that motivation of just always trying to better see what the top level is. That's what the top look for is what you've got to be better than them to get to get to to take them. So it's yeah, it's always that striving to on the top level keepers and. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's that all that desire to you know to improve and the desire to progress every week. And you know, as you say, you're watching different goalkeepers and you're taking little things that they do, and elite keepers are taking little things that they do, and constantly looking at how to better yourself. And obviously, with that strong mindset, you're able to do that, and you're focused and you're driven to be able to do that. But what I want to touch on now is I want to talk about a section that I've titled Match Fit Performance. We've talked a little bit about the mindset and what's needed to succeed every day in training and on, and on matches, on match days. But a match fit performance level, because a goalkeeper is, you know, you have so many attributes that you need as a goalkeeper. You need to be flexible. You need communication skills, you know, catching, kicking. There's There's so much involved in that. What do you do to keep yourself obviously injury free and fit? Do you do any type of stretching? What What's the keys to success in terms of maintaining fitness and, and form? Um, I try try to do as much sort of prehab in the morning as I can. So that's sort of stretching the activation side of it because it's kind of, I sort of see it as a reset button ready for training. So obviously if you're feeling stiff, if I'm feeling sore in any way come in do stretching routines foam roll get a massage off the physios if you need to releases sort of stuff like that kind of is a reset button for me to then be like all right i'm ready for training go out and then sort of other than the pre app side of it it's uh, quite I, I do a lot in the gym now mm-hmm. compared to sort of when i first become pro because i realized how much it can affect sort of your performance and if you do want to play every week sometimes twice a week for 46 games it it takes a lot out of you so being able to have the most robust body as you can is 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 massive for me and I learned that probably most when I went to Hull because at the time obviously it was a step up from Shrewsbury they had so many more bodies in the sort of sports science department that analysed everything and they got me into a level where I understood what I needed to do. Whereas before, I don't think the understanding from my me was there. So I wasn't um, as clued in on it. And then when I started doing it all and seeing the effects and after a game, I, was, I wasn't I was sore and I could go and play a game a day later if I needed to. It, mm. it made me realise how important that aspect of it was. Whereas before, I didn't really understand to the level of how big it was for your body to sort of be in the gym and do all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's incredible because you're not the first person, you know, I've had on the podcast. I've had a different goalkeeper on the podcast and they said the same thing in terms of the gym work. They wish they knew about it early. They earlier, they wish they found out about it earlier. But when you're progressing through your career and you're at that young stage in your life, sometimes you don't just realize and you don't have that information giving to you until you are at that level where, for example, for you, it was Hull. You know, you go to a club like Hull where there's a lot more staff, there's a lot more emphasis on on your on your conditioning, on your fitness levels and things like that. But what goes alongside all that is the nutrition and the diet and your sleep pattern and things like that. Do you take any supplements to help out with with, with, with you during the week? And talk to me a little bit about nutrition and the favorite foods that you eat. Yeah, again, it was when I joined Hull. Um, they had a nutritionist called Warren Bradley. It was sort of brilliant and he just sat down with me and he said like what basically what do you know what do you currently do what do you want to achieve um and it was sort of that what do you want to achieve sort of I never thought about that because I'd never been asked it so I was like oh I don't really know like what do you think and obviously they said well we want to build you up we want to make you more robust we want to do this do that and it was yeah I didn't really the only sort of supplement I thought was like omega-3 fish oils and stuff like that so the minute that they open your eyes and they say there's creatine casein all this sort of stuff just it, it just to benefit your performance you sort of think okay let me let me try it out so yeah I've, I take creatine every day that's sort of a big thing for me just it, it just helps sort of obviously I don't know what it was like what it'd be like now not having it but from when I joined Hull at 20 I've just took it sort of solidly only stopped in off season um, and it just I think it just helps me recover faster and it just helps the food that I eat sort of me my body taking as much of the goodness as possible really um, and then other than that it's just sort of regular whey protein and I try to get as much from my food, not supplements, really. I try and eat as well as I can. 
um, because I think that's I feel that's what benefits me. You could take all the supplements in the world, but if you come back and have sweets, chocolate bars, and cakes, it's it's not you're not going to see the benefit of the supplement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's I'm lucky that obviously my wife cooks really good food and I enjoy cooking as well. So we we try and eat as the main meals as healthy as we can. Obviously, we have breakfast and lunch at the club so that sort of aspect's really nicely controlled um and then yeah it's also listening to your body like knowing what to eat when and you don't want to you know, and i try and never let myself get really hungry whether it's just a protein bar here if i'm if i'm a bit peckish or whatever body now um and it's helped me it's helped me develop sort of physically um and then that's helped in turn sort of repay, repay me on the pitch with getting stronger, more recovering faster and sort of everything that goes alongside it. You mm. Ultimately, you take the supplements to see the benefits on the pitch and that's, that's what it does, but it just takes time to learn about it and sort of put it into place. We're certainly a long way away from where we were, you know, 20 years ago, where you had some of the, the elite players or the biggest names in the game talking about going out for pints during the week and going to the pub and out all night. You know, we're certainly at a completely different level now in terms of health and fitness and sports science and education. And, and I think it's great to see, you know, that the development of that side of the game has come on so much, but also a development on the pitch. And it's something I'm assuming you would have came through because in the last 15 years or so, We've seen it go from goalkeepers having to kick the ball long and look for the second ball and a potential goal scoring opportunity to goalkeepers being asked to play out from the back with their feet. Have you noticed a difference in that coming up throughout your career and playing at various clubs? Sorry, mate, you just broke up then. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll re I'll, I'll re go with that question again and. Uh, I'm sure the guys can edit that one. So just one of the things we've noticed is that the sports science has developed so much in the game, you know, nutritionally, everything has changed and got for the better. But on the pitch as well, we've went from, you know, the old fashioned goalkeepers who kick the ball long, we look for second balls, potential goal scoring opportunities, do a lot more keepers playing out from the back and controlling the ball, controlling possession. And your and your time coming up through you know, from a teenager to now and moving around at several different clubs. Have you noticed an emphasis more on that as, as your as your career has progressed? Yeah. Sort of when I was coming through, like in the youth team, obviously you tried to sort of play out from the back because it was it was the idea. It was probably just the start sort of this was going back probably nine, ten years ago. It was sort of when Barcelona were at their peak and it was trying to play like that but a lot of the time in first team football it was get up and hit the big man as far as you can um probably saying that definitely since i've turned pro sort of seven years ago now it's massive it's come down the leagues at the start it was obviously the premier league trying to do it and sort of man city have perfected it and pep and all them and then you look down now and sort of in League Two and League One, you need that ability to be able to distribute from the back and be comfortable on the ball. And sort of that is now goal is having to learn it's sort of survive or die kind of thing. You have to learn to be able to be good at it and be comfortable doing it because a lot of clubs, that's their first choice now. And obviously we we're massive on it. Um, the gaffer playing out for that. And I think it's just been viewed as why risk giving the ball away from a long kick now, whereas use it as sort of a, a free kick, like just set and play and sort of, and it, it works massively. I mean, I've, I've always wanted to be in a team that plays like that. I think it's been obviously, luckily enough, being in the England setup when you were younger, that's how they wanted you to play. So you, so I was quite comfortable from that early on. Um, so being able to be in a first team environment now that wants to play like that, it's, I, I love it. And it's, it only brings the better, the best out of you as well because you get so much more comfortable on the ball and it's if you want to get to the top level again that's what the levels you've got to get out like you look at Edison he's I think he's a freak of nature how he kicks the ball but obviously you've got to you've got to get to that level if you want to play ahead of him in the Premier League that's sort of how I look at it so yeah it's about 
improving that aspect as much as improving being able to save shots nowadays as a goalie. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. You know, you, Ederson's the perfect example, isn't he? Two or three assists a season minimum. And um, he pings the ball like a like any centre midfielder would dream of doing at times. Um, you know, phenomenal with the ball at his feet. I want to talk a little bit about training because uh, a couple of questions about training, then we'll begin to wrap it up. You mentioned about playing in the England setup when you were younger. You know, you played at various youth youth teams in the England setup, and you've also played at Hull and Cambridge. Now I played with Argyll, and you started off at Shrewsbury and things like that. What's the difference between the club training and whenever you go to an England camp? Because obviously you're only there for a short period of time, a couple of sessions, then a game versus the club level where you're every you're there every day, so to speak. You know, going through the different steps and the motions. Yeah, I think obviously being when I was a kid going there, it was a lot more intense because they only had a little time to work with you. So it was you'd sort of go away for some when you were young. Obviously, it was more tournament based, so you'd only go away and play sort of three, four games. So you had a bit longer, but I remember sort of when I got to the under 18s, it was sort of in line with the international break. So you'd go, you'd add four or five days training and then you'd play a game. So it's it was more about, it. obviously it made the coach's life so much easier because you were sort of getting the best players at that age group together. And it was just them sort of implementing the ideas of how they wanted, obviously it's now called the England DNA sort of how they wanted to play. So it was it was great. I, I loved every every call up I got. I was grateful for and every sort of opportunity I got to go and train because you look at the goalies that were my age, you've got Angus Gunn obviously in the Prem with Norwich, Dean Henderson, yeah. Freddie Woodman. Them sort of goalies you, back then you wouldn't have said or you wouldn't have realised the heights that I got to so soon. So being able to train, be around them, and obviously have the best sort of goalkeeping coaching available yeah. um, and see top, top coaches. Obviously, Neil Jews, and it was my 18s coach, he's now director of football at Plymouth. So having that coaching so early as well, it just made you improve when you went back to your club. It's fascinating and something I want to touch on. I hadn't planned to ask this question, but when you're at those youth setups and you're going through the England DNA of how to play and how they want you to play going forward. And obviously the overall aim is, you know, for the England first team, you know, to compete and to be strong, but they, they want those younger teams competing and being strong as well. Is there a fine line between development and winning or how does that work, especially when you're away at that elite level? Yeah, there is a fine line because obviously they kind of, when we were, we'd go to tournaments to win. That's that's what ultimately they wanted to do. And it was about development because you're not there so much. It was kind of more about development at your club will get you into this England sort of yeah. setup. That's what sort of the England setup is kind of the end prize for playing well at your club, playing well in the academy games, getting in the first team. So then it become probably more about Obviously, it's playing their way, but it was about winning. You went to the, you had the Euro qualifiers, the elite qualifiers, and then the tournaments. And ultimately, you remember the teams, the England teams that have gone on to win tournaments, like the 17s, 20s, and stuff like that. Um, because they, they used to sit you down and they were as blunt as anything and say, our aim is to win the 2022 World Cup or whatever. You guys will be about 27 at that point. So you'll be the core of that team. Mm -hmm. So if you want to obviously be on the journey of that, then buy into what we do, win the games that we put on and stuff like that. And that's sort of, you look at the players that have gone on and sort of, I was in the same team as Delhi, um, Damari Gray and players like that. They do, they get through the age groups, they play in the England age groups and they go to major tournaments and compete. And that's obviously what the England setups there to do is to build build winners for the, the senior squad mm -hmm. it's a it's a fascinating insight because it's something that you know as someone who, who speaks to various footballers that i've always wanted to know about that line between development and winning and uh, because you have all those famous quotes winning is the only thing that matters and all this type of thing and then you have maybe serial winners who come into a club for two or three years win trophies but then when they leave there's no youth coming through and stuff like that so then you're in this catch 22 what do we do here? And it's always just something that's fascinated me. So it's amazing to hear that insight. And um, as we begin to wrap up, I just want to talk a little bit about 
what you've done personally to improve your game. So we've talked about mindset. We've talked about, um, you know, the match fit performance and things like that. But is there anything that you've noticed in your game, whether it be a good thing or a bad thing that you've worked on individually outside of your club training, whether you've went and done something yourself to improve something that you've noticed? I'd probably say outside sort of the club, it's been a lot of the physical stuff. So going to the gym, looking and sort of breaking down the, the sort of goal you want to become and what you need physically to do that. Because obviously you get the pitch time um, at training and wherever you need. And it's obviously hard to replicate that away from the club because you've got the coaches, you've got the, the facilities and the pitches and everything and so on. So coming away from that, it's... It is going to the gym, making sure you get stronger, you get faster. And you obviously, you've got that at the club as well, but then it's the sort of individual aspects that you want to add to it and do more than other people. So it's going to the gym and doing leg day when, let's say, the first... Because obviously you can't always, as a second-choice goalie especially, you're very gym-orientated on what the first team are doing. So. If they've got a game on the Tuesday, you know you're not playing, but it affects obviously your gym routine throughout the week that sort of you you built yourself on. So it's yeah, it's about doing what's right for your body away from the place because it is it's not just about what you do at the training ground and what you do there because that's only a small small portion of your day away from it. You've got to make sure you eat right and do other bits and recovery as well. Go into the pool, go in forage, all that sort of stuff. Hydrate throughout the day. It it affects you probably the day after the most, not there and then. Like you don't hydrate and drink two litres of water and then an hour late you feel amazing, but mm. you feel your muscles feel better the next day. Learning just the right balance of pitch. I try and see myself as the stuff I do off the pitch to get me as good as I can for the next day, prove as much as you can on pitch. So by making your body as robust and as fit as you can, it gives you as much time on the grass as possible and as least injuries as possible. Absolutely fascinating insight, you know, to, to see what you do outside of, of, you know, the corporate training and such. You know, we have a lot of young people who listen to this who want to become professional footballers. And there's certainly been a lot of lessons through what we've talked about today that they can take and they can incorporate into their lives, whether it be in nutrition, whether it be gym work, whether it be the hard work, the dedication, the mindset stuff. But if just as we wrap it up now, if you could give one piece of advice to a young person who wants to become a professional footballer, what would you give? What would you tell them? Um, I'd probably say... Just try and learn off everything you do. Learn off as many people as you can, um, especially the ones that have been professionals, played as high as they can. Um, and just take as much as you can from as many people that are willing to show you what they do. I mean, that's sort of what I've always tried to do. And by picking up their habits or what they do on and off the pitch or anything that you can take from, even if it's the tiniest thing, and add it to what you want to do it'll it'll help you a million percent sound advice absolutely sound advice you know always learn always develop and always keep an eye out on what you want to become and the goalkeeper that you want to become Calm. this has been a phenomenal conversation i've really enjoyed it and um, where can people follow you on social media and connect with you and see what you're up to i've got twitter and instagram um i don't know my tag off my heart i'll be honest um, <laughs> but yeah then anything on that i mean it's sort of where i'm at but yeah no i've loved it thank you for having me on the podcast well guys you've had it right there he's on instagram he's on twitter give him a follow see what he's up to keep up to date with his journey as he continues to progress and develop it's been a phenomenal conversation and um, as i said earlier in the podcast at match fit football youtube facebook and instagram for all your match fit needs callum thanks again for coming on the show and thank you everyone for listening cheers Aaron.